So welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us on the line. It's, um, we're really pleased to see so many, many folks um, uh, from you know, across the province really joining us today on the live, on the, uh, live stream right now and, um, and we'll, we'll get the recording up on, on our Facebook and other platforms um, later on this morning. My name is Ainsley Crone, and I'm the ad acting Manitoba advocate for children and youth. On behalf of myself and my team, um, I am grateful for each of you who are joining us on the line. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to the stories of these young children that we're gonna share with you today. Um, I'm gonna be sharing a new special report that my office has been working on for more than a year. But before we get started, uh, I'm going to ask our knowledge keeper, Cheryl Alexander, once again, to start us off in a good way with a prayer. Bonjour. I'm just trying to get my screen back on. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Alexander. I'm the knowledge keeper here at the Manitoba Advocate. My traditional name is Kanu Abik. I'm from the Sturgeon clan. Bonjour. Now in a mission, nom gom ga gijigak. Jimano nandanam ga wendaman. Jimano wabamang, nichi anishnabe. Jimano non danag, nichi anishnabe. Jimano gangano, nichi anishnabe. Shago, jimano wichiwag, nichi anishnabe. Miigwich gizimana tu. Thank you. Miigwich, yeah. I want to begin by uh, saying that the Office of the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth acknowledge that as a team, we live and work on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the beautiful homeland of the Métis Nation. We strive every day to dedicate ourselves and the public resources that we're given to making meaningful contributions to the lives of children and youth, but especially to the lives and experiences of First Nations and Métis children and youth in our province. We do this by listening to the voices and opinions of Indigenous young people in our work, by ensuring that our staff team reflects the diversity of the families that we serve, by consulting with community members outside of our office, by working in collaboration with the diversity of Indigenous peoples who live here, and overall, to ensuring that our office embraces and that our work reflects a philosophy of continual learning and growing in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So again, just a reminder to the media on the line today, we are gonna do questions at the end. Um, if you have questions that come up that you wanna type into the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, but I will uh, be taking questions at the end of the presentation as well. And I wanna provide a content warning for anyone watching uh, both the live stream as well as the playback. The presentation that I'm gonna be taking you through today includes discussion of severe child maltreatment and abuse. We're gonna explore with you the stories of 19 young children who were maltreated and who died. The loss of these children is heavy and we dedicate this report to them. As a community and a province, we must learn lessons from these children's short lives in order to make all of our communities safer for all children and youth in Manitoba. Today's presentation is to take you through the special report I'm releasing today, which is called Still Waiting, Investigating Child Maltreatment After the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry. This special report emerges from our concern that deaths of young children due to maltreatment continue to be a serious concern in our province 15 years after the death of Phoenix Sinclair and seven years after the end of the public inquiry into her life and maltreatment death. Because our office is notified of all child and youth deaths in Manitoba, we notice that deaths of young children due to maltreatment and abuse continue to be a significant theme here. So we set out to learn what has really changed since Commissioner Hughes issued his final report from the inquiry, which included 62 recommendations aimed at improving safety of young children in our province. To understand what's happened since the Phoenix Sinclair inquiry, we first focused on reviews and investigations of 19 children who died after being maltreated when they were under the age of five years old, and like Phoenix had child welfare involvement prior to their death. Secondly, we assessed the provincial government's compliance with the outstanding recommendations that were made in the Phoenix Sinclair inquiry. My team and I have been working on this report for more than a year. And in fact, 
Um, these reports are always uh, a reflection of a significant team effort. So I want to express my thanks and my gratitude to the entire team at our office. And on behalf of the many dedicated folks um, at our office who have had a hand in the special report that I'm releasing today, I will say that we are grateful for the opportunity to share these children's stories with you, some of whom you may already be familiar with. A key piece of today's special report looks at what has changed in Manitoba since the death of Phoenix Sinclair, and then since the public inquiry into her death, which as I mentioned, concluded more than seven years ago. In June, 2005, five-year-old Phoenix Sinclair died after suffering severe maltreatment from her caregivers spanning months. The Manitoba government launched a public inquiry into her death in 2011, which was completed by the Honorable Commissioner Ted Hughes in 2013, and then was made public in early 2014. That report contains 62 recommendations. One thing that you're gonna see in the information that we're sharing with you today is how similar many of the children's stories were to the tragic circumstances under which Phoenix lived and then died. In fact, child maltreatment is a major issue in Manitoba. But before we go further, I'm gonna define what we mean when we say child maltreatment. This term refers to the harm or risk of harm that a child or a youth may experience while in the care of a person that they trust or depend on. And that can include a parent, a sibling, other relative, teacher, caregiver, or guardian. Harm can occur through direct actions by the person, which are known as acts of commission, or through the person's neglect to provide a component of care that's necessary for healthy child growth and development, which is known as acts of omission. There are five types of child maltreatment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional harm, and exposure to family violence. Child maltreatment is preventable. Research has shown that understanding and identifying protective factors and risk factors for child maltreatment are equally important. Increasing protective factors may minimize the likelihood of children being maltreated. Professionals who work with families benefit from a broad understanding of the factors that may place children at risk of harm, the factors that can protect them from harm, and the ways in which these risk and protective factors interact. Having an understanding of the risk and protective factors that contribute to child maltreatment gives the service provider a more holistic view of the family experience, and ultimately this allows for the development of effective and successful planning with the family, and assist the family in identifying additional services and supports that would meet their needs. Multiple risk factors were evident in the files of the 19 children that we highlight in the special report. Notable challenges included parental mental health concerns, substance misuse, social isolation, and family violence. As mentioned, all of these deaths were caused by the actions of adults who were responsible to protect the children. This report that we're sharing with you today was guided by the following questions that I have highlighted for you on the screen here. First, how has Child and Family Services changed since Phoenix Sinclair's death? How can Manitoba better deliver Child and Family Services that improve the well being and safety for children under the age of five? What were the missed opportunities for interventions? And what were the gaps in the services for these 19 children and their families? And then finally, what is the status of the recommendations made since Commissioner Hughes' final report from the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry? As you're likely aware, our office receives a formal notification from the Chief Medical Examiner's Office every time a child, youth, or young adult under the age of 21 dies in Manitoba. So for this report, we examined over 10 years worth of data to determine which children met the criteria for this report. Between September 15th, 2008 and March 31st, 2020, there was a total of 1,383 deaths of children under the age of five. Out of those 1,383 deaths, 273 of those deaths were assessed as being in scope and reviewable by the Manitoba Advocate. Of the 273 reviewable child deaths, we examined those children whose cause of death may have been a result of their caregivers' actions, who survived serious injuries caused by their caregivers but lived with profound impacts and then died years later, 
or whose medical examiner's report and autopsy stated that the child had suffered multiple inflicted injuries of different ages. So out of all of that, a total of 19 children were identified. We examined the investigations and reviews that were previously completed by our office. Particular attention was paid to the documented risk and protective factors for child maltreatment and the delivery of child welfare services through an ecological model. We also identified missed opportunities for interventions or gaps in the child welfare service delivery. And as you can see by the graphics on the screen right now, the 19 children that we're talking about for this aggregate special report were very young. 12 of the 19 children were under the age of two when they were injured and then died from those injuries. Two of the 19 children did not die immediately following the injuries they sustained. For those two children, they survived the event, but their injuries were life altering and they required significant care afterwards. One of them died before they turned five and one lived for a few years longer before dying as a result of complications associated with their injuries. All four of the, C of the uh, CFS authorities are represented in the stories of the 19 children. Four of the 19 children were in care of CFS when they died. The others were not in care, but CFS either had opened files on the family or the family had received CFS services in the 12 months that preceded the death of the child, which is how the death came into scope for review by the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth. At the time of their deaths, the 19 children represented all five regional health authorities in Manitoba. 16% were in the Northern region, 11% from Prairie Mountain, 5% from Interlake Eastern, 53% from Winnipeg, and 16% were in the Southern region. Police were involved in investigating each of the 19 deaths. As a result of those investigations, 15 people faced criminal charges related to the death of the child. Of those 15 individuals, nine were convicted, two cases did not result in conviction, and four of the cases are currently pending trial. And it's important for me to note that in those four cases that are currently pending trial, our office has only conducted preliminary reviews to date, as legally our office has to wait to do a full investigation until the conclusion of all criminal proceedings. So for the purposes of this uh, special report being released today, those four children's stories are included in today's report for data purposes only at this point. Of the children that we feature in our report, three are well known to the public due to extensive reporting in the media. Phoenix Sinclair, Kiara Williams, and Jaylene Sanderson Redhead. We use pseudonyms for the other children to protect their privacy and the privacy of surviving family. Kiera's death occurred nine years after Phoenix died and seven months after the Manitoba government received the final report of the inquiry into Phoenix's death. Kiera had not yet reached her second birthday when on July 17, 2014, she died from severe injuries after being maltreated. Jaylene Sanderson Redhead was another child who was maltreated and died. She was one and a half years old at the time of her death in June 2009 and had suffered multiple inflicted injuries. Jaylene's death was the subject of a public inquest, and that inquest report was also released in May 2014, the same year as the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry report was released to the public and three months before Kiera's death. As an independent, nonpartisan office which sits outside of government structures, when we review or investigate a death, we always strive to approach our responsibilities by examining all of the evidence through the eyes of the child. And for us, this means that not only do we examine records and case files and other documentation, but we reach out to family, we interview service providers and other people who knew and loved the child and their family so that we can really understand the child's story in a broader and more holistic context. As an office, we also seek to understand the ongoing impacts of intergenerational trauma. Rooted in injustices and oppression, we see the connections between systemic racism, interruption of family structure and culture, and higher numbers of preventable child deaths. We also see the reclaiming of culture, of power, of traditional supports that's happening in communities, and it's our hope that special reports like the one that I'm releasing today can be helpful to families, communities, and governments as our province and our country continue to evolve from the past. 
When working with infants and toddlers, there are two vital aspects of the case management process that we find in our reviews and investigations are too often missed by agencies. One is assessments and the other is reunification planning for children in agency care. As part of our investigation, the advocate requested from the four CFS authorities, their reunification policies and practices and their assessment tools specific to children under the age of five, plus the strengths and limitations of each. And we know, of course, that different agencies in Manitoba use different tools. So in terms of reunification, agencies reported various assessment tools to us, including tools laid out through the structured decision-making and signs of safety approaches, among others. One agency talked to us about um, the fact that they are in the process of developing an agency-specific reunification assessment tool that better meets the needs of the families that they serve. Agencies reported that when it comes to having a successful reunification, the following are some of the important elements that they look to. Regular family visitation while a child is in care, providing financial support to the family, providing needs specific training for parents and other caregivers, having ongoing supports after the child is returned home, and then finally ensuring that the family has stable housing. There's also some ongoing gaps in services that agencies identified including a lack of resources in First Nations communities, a lack of wraparound community supports, a need for foster parent involvement in the reunification process, a need for aftercare planning, and more provincial funding for these measures. All of this to say that there are various approaches that CFS agencies are currently taking when it comes to case management and more specifically in assessments and reunification processes. What's most important is that processes within an agency or under an authority ought to be meaningful for the local context, consistently delivered and supervised and monitored with quality assurance standards in place. I'd like to share uh, one of the children's stories from the report. Um, we, we include a number of uh, stories in the actual special report, but I just wanna share one that um, helps to illustrate some of the points that I was just talking about. So we include in our full special report, the story of one young child who was apprehended and placed in agency care at birth. She was reunified with her family seven months later. However, throughout the reunification planning process, the CFS agency did not seek to identify her needs or those of her family. The agency did not conduct an assessment of the family situation and did not provide the supports that the family needed to welcome their baby back home. In this situation, the child who had been reunified with her family died just before her second birthday. She was dehydrated, significantly underweight, and at the time of her death had bruises, abrasions, lacerations, and healing bone fractures of varying ages from trauma that had been inflicted after her return home. An effective reunification plan would have looked at the strengths and the needs of the family and their child, and set the family up to feel confident and successful in resuming care for their child. It would have provided an opportunity to reestablish relationships, recognize strengths, address needs, and discuss coping strategies, ensuring that the family knew what to do and who to reach out to if things did not go as smoothly as hoped and intended. What we saw instead in our review of the agency's files and other documentation was that the reunification was seen by the agency as the end of a process and not the beginning of the family living together in a new dynamic. Our review revealed just how overwhelmed and unprepared her family felt to resume her care, given her caregiver's own challenges and the dynamics within the home. What's clear from our entire investigation and from conversations with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and government stakeholders is the need for an ecological model of care. In the final report of the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry, Commissioner Hughes said that his findings and recommendations were informed in part by evidence that was provided by Dr. Alexandra Wright. Wright asserts that applying an ecological approach to child welfare practice as a framework is important when examining service planning and provision. The focus of child welfare practice from an ecological standpoint positions the child within their environment and recognizes the various components of theirs and their family's life. This system recognizes and challenges the impacts of systemic oppression that families face at the system, community, organization, and direct practice levels. 
So the image that you see on your screen right now is one that our office adapted from Dr. Wright's model. It's important to note that these levels are not exclusive of one another, but overlap and interact to impact the lives of children, youth, and families. And it's also really important to note that the ecological model that we include in today's special report is not new, but it reflects elements of traditional parenting wisdom from across the globe. So at the system level, the widest purple arc, it's important to explore and understand the negative effects of systemic issues. These include racism, poverty, sexism, and the impacts of colonization, residential and day schools, and the 60s scoop on First Nations and Métis communities in our province. Because of structural inequalities and systemic racism, there is still a disproportionate number of First Nations and Métis children in care of the Manitoba child welfare system. At the system level, child protection means protecting every Manitoba child in effective, equitable and culturally appropriate ways. Deficits at this level undermine child safety and well-being, and when left unaddressed, place children at risk of harm and even death. So at the community level, which is the second widest light blue arc on your screen there, we see the child's needs and strengths within the context of the family and the community. So when viewed within this context, a focus on building on the capacity of the community can empower people to engage with one another and with service providers, seeking out solutions for culturally respectful and appropriate services that benefit children and families, and ultimately that benefits the health and strength of the community. The social determinants of health are social and economic factors within the broader determinants of health that relate to an individual's place in society, such as income, education, or employment. Inequities among social determinants of health must be addressed to make healthier communities for children. And third is the orange arc here. That's the organizational level. The quality of services delivered by an agency staff to children and their families is directly connected to the level of support that they get from their organization and the organization's capacity and functioning. This support includes a vast array of factors like staff education and training, staff recruitment and retention, workload, supervision, community relations, information technology, programs, and service delivery. Each of those elements contributes to the strength of an agency, keeping staff feeling supported and engaging and empowering children and families. Best practice requires ongoing evaluation and quality assurance, which are essential in identifying areas for service improvement and better outcomes for children. And then finally, we get to the direct practice level at the center circle there. And that relates to case management. Child and family services agencies in Manitoba are responsible, of course, to deliver services that identify, assess, and address the needs of children, youth, and families. So next, I'm going to go over the provincial government's progress in implementing the 62 recommendations that are laid out in the 2014 Sinclair uh, Inquiry Report. To complete our assessment, we requested information from the government of Manitoba on the activities that they have undertaken for each of the outstanding recommendations. As mentioned, Hugh's report, which was released to the public in January 2014, included 62 recommendations. In November 2016, our office released a progress report to the public on the provincial government's progress at that point on the inquiry recommendations. In 2016, we reported that 18 of the 62 recommendations were considered complete or complete ongoing. 44 of the 62 recommendations remained in progress at that time. Four years later, in last December, December 2020, the government of Manitoba provided an update to us on the actions it's taken since 2016 to implement the remaining 44 recommendations. Our team reviewed progress on the recommendations, as well as whether actions taken by the government are compliant with the intent of each recommendation. Preliminary determinations took place following an internal peer review process at our office to ensure consistency across our analysis. And in determining an overall implementation rate, each recommendation was assessed and assigned one of seven compliance levels, ranging from insufficiently explained and non-compliant to fully compliant or alternate solution. 
Our full compliance process, you might remember, is uh, explained in our first compliance report, which is called Are They Listening, which we, which we released last fall and is available on our website. Links to the compliance model that we have developed and that we use extensively here in Manitoba, as well as a more complete discussion on the issue is also found in today's special report. So our review of the provincial government's compliance with the inquiry recommendations indicates that five of the 44 outstanding recommendations saw government provide an alternative solution, which did meet the intent of those five recommendations. 11 of the 44 outstanding recommendations are considered fully compliant. So that's 25% of the remainder of the 44 recommendations. Eight recommendations are largely compliant, which means that most of the requirements or criteria outlined in the recommendation were met, but not all of them were. Four recommendations are partially compliant, meaning that some of the requirements were met. 11 of the recommendations are deemed limitedly compliant. And this means that some action has been taken toward meeting the intent of the re recommendation, but none of the requirements have yet been met. Four recommendations were deemed non-compliant, and one recommendation was deemed insufficiently explained. And this means that the information provided for inaction on a recommendation or the alternative solution presented did not have sufficient justification to meet the requirements or intent of the recommendation that was issued by Commissioner Hughes. Of the total recommendations made by Hughes in 2014, so of the 62 recommendations, 34 have now been completed, which is 55% of the recommendations he issued. Overall, we found that progress since 2016 has been slow. In the advocate's initial assessment in 2016, only 29% of the recommendations were deemed complete. And per this latest assessment, the percentage of completed recommendations increased to 55% completion, which means that 34 of the total 62 uh, recommendations from the inquiry have now been completed. But at this rate, the recommendations honoring the legacy of Phoenix Sinclair will not be completed until 2028, which will be 14 years after the inquiry and 23 years after her death. Progress on recommendations has also not been even across different categories or themes of recommendations. And so on the next slide, I'm going to take you through a little bit of a thematic breakdown of what, what we mean when, when I say that. So we've noticed patterns in the progress with recommendations. 20% of the recommendations in the final report from the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry were, as you might remember, aimed at broadening and strengthening the role of our office, the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth. So those 13 recommendations regarding the Manitoba Advocate have an average compliance rate of 90%. The majority of the recommendations became fully compliant with the proclamation of the new Advocate for Children and Youth Act, which came in uh, to force in 2018, March of 2018. And that created standalone legislation and expanded the powers of our office beyond child welfare. There are seven outstanding recommendations about the social work profession and seven more about quality assurance within the system. There are also seven outstanding recommendations about service integration, six recommendations about service improvements, three recommendations about funding, and one outstanding on the topic of children's rights. The one recommendation with zero compliance is aimed at incorporating the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into all legislation that serves children in Manitoba. And while the provincial government included mention of the UNCRC in our legislation, the Advocate for Children and Youth Act, the UNCRC continues to be absent from other child serving legislation in Manitoba, including from the Child and Family Services Act. Overall, we found that while systemic changes have taken place, including changes in legislation and oversight, not a lot has changed for families. As you can see from this graph, recommendations developed to advance the integration of services, to improve services, and to increase funding for prevention supports have very low average compliance ratings. And in the special report being released today, um, you'll find in Appendix C a full list of compliance analysis for each of the Hughes recommendations. So I'm going to move on now to the new recommendations that are stemming from our report, which I'm releasing today. 
There are five areas for improvement in which I am issuing formal recommendations to the provincial government and the child welfare system today. The five recommendations also reflect needed improvements at the different levels of the ecological model of care that we discuss and explore in today's special report. So for my first recommendation, I'm calling on the government of Manitoba to implement the outstanding recommendations from the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry. So this would include the government submitting progress reports to our office on a biannual schedule following the existing Macy Handbook for Compliance Assessment. My office would undertake an assessment of these updates and report publicly on the status of implementation annually until completed. And this is very similar. Um, this is the same process that we use for all recommendations coming out of our office. Recommendation number two, which is consistent with call to action number five of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm recommending that the government of Manitoba work with First Nations and Métis governments and community stakeholders to ensure access to evidence-informed and culturally safe parenting programs and resources for caregivers of children under the age of five in every community across Manitoba with special attention to rural and remote communities. This recommendation would help assess available parenting resources in Manitoba for parents of children under the age of five identify geographic gaps in resources and areas where existing resources can be improved, develop and enhance resource supports for caregivers, integrate parenting resources within existing community infrastructures. So by that, I mean schools, community resource centers and others. And then finally, create and implement a strategy that ensures the ongoing dissemination of information regarding available parenting resources to caregivers of young children across our province. For my third recommendation, I'm recommending that each Child and Family Services Authority develop and provide the necessary resources to implement a culturally appropriate reunification policy with their agencies. And in those situations where a reunification policy already exists, I'm calling on the authorities to review and revise the policy with their agencies to ensure compliance with the details of this recommendation. The resources created should ensure ongoing and meaningful involvement with the family throughout the duration of the reunification process, which requires small worker to family ratios and availability of supports. The policies should also review risk and protective factors specific to the child and their family at reunification and assess how the child and their caregivers explicitly address the developmental, physical, educational, cultural, and spiritual needs of each child being reunified with their family. And there's more details about this recommendation for the authorities that's laid out in the special report as well. For my fourth recommendation, I'm recommending that all child and family services authorities ensure that their agencies complete case reviews for every child in care under the age of five for whom reunification is planned. These case reviews should reflect the authority's reunification policies, which should be reviewed in accordance with uh, the third recommendation. Completed case reviews ought to also be reviewed and signed by a supervisor. And lastly, number five, um, I'm recommending that the Department of Families through the joint training team develop and administer mandatory training for frontline workers and supervisors on the risk and protective factors of child maltreatment and best practices for reunification. This would require developing training, scheduling and administering the training regularly, and tracking the number and percentage of existing and new frontline staff and supervisors who have received the training. In conclusion, some major changes have occurred in Manitoba's child welfare system in the past 15 years. Those include the continued devolution of the system, new child welfare agencies being established, and more recently, federal legislation aimed at ensuring children can be looked after by their home communities with sovereign systems for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And while these large scale changes alter jurisdiction and legal mandates and stakeholder responsibilities and other structural factors, our office continues to highlight how important it is that while those big structural shifts are occurring, that the focus must be on whether families are feeling more supported and whether children in our communities are safer. We need to collectively ensure the best outcomes and safety for all of Manitoba's children. And we do this by supporting caregivers and communities. Following the steps that I lay out here today is one step of many on that journey. 
And as always, our office will continue to track and monitor these five new recommendations, and we will continue to report publicly on them. If you're interested in that recommendations tracking work, you can find our recommendations tracking along with all of our special reports and the other reports referenced today on our website at manitobaadvocate.ca. And as a reminder um, for those folks on the line, um, we are also gonna be releasing a special report later on uh, before the end of the month that reviews the children's disability services. So with that, I'm gonna just say thank you for your time and attention today, and we can open it up for some questions now. So please mention either in the text box, box if you'd like to ask one, um, or feel free to uh, just unmute yourself and, uh, and um, we'll take questions now. Thank you. No questions? We'll also have time for one-on-one -on -one interviews later if you want to contact me and set that up. Um, but does anyone from the media have a question? Kelly Malone with the Canadian Press. Um, okay. Hi, can you kind of focus or speak specifically to which of the Phoenix Sinclair recommendations need to be enacted on um, kind of immediately to curb this trend of child maltreatment? Sure, so uh, thanks for that question, Kelly. So what I would say to that is that, um, you know, Commissioner Hughes did a really outstanding job in the inquiry breaking the inquiry into different levels. So, you know, he had the different phases of the inquiry that looked specifically at direct service involvement and then the broader systemic issues, community related issues and, and so forth. And so, you know, what we found in our analysis of the, the government's progress on those recommendations is that a lot of work has happened at that larger level, the systemic level, um, you know, big structural system changes but that progress remains really slow on the changes that have a direct impact on families and on children. Um, and so I would say that, you know, on behalf of our office, that I think that our urgency, um, I mean, really all of the recommendations are, are important, but there has been some good progress on those big things. What we need to see more progress on are the, the recommendations, like I said, that make direct impacts on the lives of family and actually make children safer. And so I would, I would encourage you to take a look at the appendix, um, I think it's appendix C in the, in the report, um, where we break down a really detailed assessment of all of the outstanding recommendations um, and our reasons for uh, you know, the, the compliance levels that we have assigned to each of them. Are you able to speak about where Manitoba is when it comes to these really tragic deaths comparatively to other regions, say similar regions as Saskatchewan or, or Alberta? Um, I mean, I don't, you know, like we're, our office is certainly connected nationally through the Canadian Council of Child and Youth Advocates. And I would say that child maltreatment is, uh, is a topic and an issue across our country. Um, but I would say that, you know, obviously our focus um, remains, uh, remains on Manitoba. And I would say that, um, you know, child maltreatment, both in, you know, in all the different areas of our work. So, you know, child death notifications coming in on our investigation side of the office, as well as our frontline advocacy services. Um, you know, we have people out in the community all the time who are flagging um, child maltreatment as a significant issue. And especially at a time like this where, um, you know, while all of us are living under um, various public health restrictions um, due to the global pandemic, um, and we're seeing that children have less contact with some of those regular adults in their lives, um, you know, child maltreatment um, and underreported child maltreatment is something that continues to be a significant area of concern for us. And my final question, how has block funding, um, has it 
brought any improvements. Um, it was mentioned briefly in the report, but can you speak a little bit to the changes um, around this when we consider block funding, single envelope funding, whatever term? Sure. Um, yeah, and so we do speak about it a little bit in the in the report. It's a it's an issue that um, our office continues to um, to explore and learn more about because, as you can imagine, there are diverse uh, opinions and views on um, on you know block funding or single envelope funding. Um, you know, in in talking with uh, some of the agencies and some of the um, various stakeholders within the system as well as with uh, folks from the government departments um you know i think the the intent of block funding was always to provide more autonomy uh, at the local level or at the agency and authority level to be able to really tailor services to the needs of their family um, but the rollout of block funding has been met with some real resistance is, uh, and concern, as, as you likely know, um, because what's happening, it seems, is that there, um, you know, agencies and authorities are sometimes really struggling to be able to move some of, you know, their intent was to move a lot of stuff into the front end preventative services, um, but, uh, but that isn't always the case. And so uh, it's an area, it's an issue that uh, that our office continues to monitor and watch because um, you know they're they're still uh, evolving evolving ideas and opinions on on uh, block funding. Any other questions? Hi, it's Brittany Hobson from APTN News. Hi, Brittany. Hi, just a couple questions. Um, so when looking at maltreatment, um, I mean, you give a number of recommendations and there's there's different examples and I guess with each family it's different, but is there any way that you could sum up, I guess, in these cases, like what exactly these, these families are facing? Um, well, I mean, you can imagine that it's really different in every situation, it's different in every home. Um, what I what I would say is that um, you know I think that I think that it would be you know fair to say that um, every parent wants to do their best, and um, and but parents come with you know stories, they come with history, and uh, we actually had the opportunity. I don't know if you saw it in in the report that you saw, that you were reading. But we had the opportunity to speak to uh, a parent who's currently in custody uh, as a result of their involvement um, in the death of a child. And, you know, it was really, um, again, illuminating. And I'll tell you that sitting with parents um, through these processes is some of the most impactful moments of our work. Um, and that is also true when we sit with a parent who had a role in the death of a child. Um, and so we, we include her story in this report because we wanted to really help the public understand um, that while, you know, while nothing that we can, we can say about her story or necessarily what, what she shared with us absolves the individual from, from responsibility, it's important for us to, to approach that information with a level of um, understanding and compassion that you know, parents sometimes come with uh, really challenging stories um, that they emerge from and become parents from, and um, and so it's really important that um, that when we're looking at things like child maltreatment or trying to prevent uh, prevent injuries to young people um, or provide services that meet the needs of families, that we're really understanding of the stories that people emerge from. And, um, and that is certainly true uh, in the story of the mother um, who we share. I think it's on page 22 of the special report. Thank you. Um, and kind of on a similar note, uh, you guys go in a lot to reunification and we're, we do hear a lot about this push for reunification, um, but clearly by some of the examples in the report, um, the, I guess, support after that is, is not there. Can you go in a, into a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, it's sort of uh, similar to the, the really brief example that I provided during the presentation this morning. Um, and it's one that we include in the full report that Sometimes reunification is seen as the end of a process as opposed to the beginning of a new dynamic in the family home. And, you know, as long as there are, um, 
as long as there are needs within a family home, if a, if a family is involved with a, with a system like Child and Family Services, there is some responsibility there that the services ensure that that transition point um, goes smoothly and that parents feel equipped to, um, to properly care for their children in safe ways. And we know that not all caregivers are safe at all times. Um, that's the reality of, uh, of things in, you know, in our communities. And it's one of, I mean, it's obviously the reason why a system like Child and Family Services needs to exist. Um, but it's that point after the transition, um, you know, and transitions are always uh, a piece of, uh, of really good service uh, delivery. We'll look at those points of transition. So whether we're talking about um, the reunification of a child back home, whether we're talking about transitioning from, uh, you know, being a youth to being a young adult, um, you know, coming in and out of care, those points of transition are real opportunities for really good wraparound services to make sure that appropriate assessments are happening, because there's a lot of um, really important information that can come from comprehensive assessments so that services understand what sort of needs are inside the family um, so that resources and supports can then be wrapped around that group of folks. Thank you. And just my last question. Um, so I guess looking at um, the remaining recommendations from the Phoenix and Claire inquiry, and I think it was 2028 or something, if you said the government keeps going at the pace that they're going at, yeah. um, I mean, what What's the what's the risk then for ch children and youth? Like, say, if if they keep going the way they are. Sure. Well, I mean, I think you know some people would look at that number and say, you know, fifty five percent. That's that's some progress. That's not too bad. Um, and it's true. There has been uh, some some good progress in different areas. But what um, I think what our message would be is that you know in the ensuing time, while we wait another you know five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, um, there are young children that are growing up right now who need services right now. And so if those changes that, you know, Hughes, um, Hughes laid out a really clear blueprint for, for child safety in Manitoba. And, um, and while we're waiting um, for those changes to be enacted, um, there are little ones who are growing up and who are not always safe in their environments. And, um, and so the sooner that those changes can be made and others, um, you know, the, the safer that, that children are gonna be in our communities. Hi, Ainsley, Stephanie Lassou from City News. Hi, Stephanie. Um, you spoke about missed assessments, failures to follow up that whole transition part through all your analysis and your research here, how would you generally characterize some of the internal organization in the CFS system? Well, I would say it's not uh, universal across the system. I would say that there are, you know, different agencies and uh, different authorities. It, it looks very different, um, you know, one, one place to another within the system. Um, I would say that, um, that there are, um, generally really dedicated uh, folks that work inside the child and family services system uh, across the province who really have a heart for children, who have a heart for community building, and who want to do good things for kids. Um, I would also say that, um, that sometimes those, you know, if we look at the ecological model again, um, some of the, the organizational health and strength is sometimes where um, where the challenges for good service delivery can come. So if you are a worker who, who has a really high caseload, for example, or who has um, a caseload that is spread over a large geographic area, and so you're having to travel frequently and large distances um, around that, you know, that takes away from time that you can spend with your families, um, you know, whether you have access to training, um, whether you have access to uh, those other wraparound services um, that that families really need in order to be able to um, to heal and to move forward in, in their lives, that all of that will really impact um, the quality of service delivery uh, for families and inside communities. And so that's why, you know, we talk in this report about the importance of looking at um, community infrastructure and that, um, you know, and the, the system infrastructure, um, because it can't just be about the worker who's assigned to your case. 
Um, if we only look at who is actually got their hands on the case, we're going to miss a whole bunch of other things that actually have an impact on the health and quality of that service delivery. Any other questions for books? Uh, yeah, I have a question. It's Camille from Radio Canada. Hello. I, hello there. I will just like to know briefly or in general, why did you choose the ecological approach? So why do you think it's the best way to assess cases and propose recommendations? Sure. Um, well, what we wanted to do here is really highlight the good work that was done as part of the Phoenix Sinclair Inquiry. And, um, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, Commissioner Hughes really spoke about um, that model, you know, when Dr. Wright presented um, her evidence as part of the inquiry process, um, you know, that, um, that model really makes a lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense, not only because um, there's a lot of evidence to show that if you address, um, address uh, both investments and development at those different levels, that it is going to have a good benefit um, for, for young people and their families. But it also makes a lot of sense because, as I said during the presentation, that is really built on the wisdom of traditional uh, parenting. And, and so that's true for, um, you know, First Nations and Métis uh, parenting wisdom um, from here, here at home, as well as, as cultures from around the globe. And so for us, it really made a lot of sense. It really spoke to us um, with the things that we see as well. So that, um, you know, when we're looking at, at a child death, for example, or, you know, through our advocacy services division, when we're looking at, um, you know, the quality of services, we can't, as I was saying before, we can't just look at what a worker is doing, that we have to also look, look at a more holistic and and, uh, and broad context, because all of those things are factors that will impact the health and safety of young people and their families. Thank you. Thanks. There aren't any more questions, but I'm just gonna remind everyone that we can do interviews later with Ainsley. Um, you can call or email me to set one up. Um, I'll just share our contact information on the screen here too. Um, if you need to get a hold of us, anything else you want to add, Ainsley? Um, no, I would just say, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, thanks and gratitude for the team um, who helped build this report. It, it is certainly a group effort and, uh, and a thanks to everyone who joined us on the line this morning and everybody watching on playback. We appreciate your, your attention to, to these stories and, um, and we thank you for joining us. I think we can welcome Cheryl back here too to help close us with a prayer. Cheryl, are you, oh, I didn't see your name there. I thought you had maybe left us. Cheryl, can you, yes. can you close us in a prayer, please? I can. Miigwech ni mashumas. Miigwech nokumas. Gibas away as the young nom gom. Miigwech nakit nom gom. Gimme the young, mino bamatiziwan. Miigwech nakit nom gom. Gimme the young. Nisawin. Miigwitch kishke me oji, miziang, madizi owen. Oji miziang, nabish. Oji miziang, wisiag, bisiag, adu de de. Kik. Minawa nabishing, ayak kik. Miigwitch wabanon, jawanon, eshpamuk, minawa ke witanon. Miigwitch kizi manatu. Oho. Miigwitch, Cheryl. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.